go ahead and do it. Let's go. Oh God, there's that bring back memory. There's a lot of good stories out there, these men that lived through it and, you know, and it's time that, you know, they were brought out. They've got movement out there, and they figure it's going to break into contact. TT time, appreciate it if you can shoot it now. How much are you going to be needing? Uh, this is too, too far. Uh, we'll take it uh, all night long if you can give it. Uh, how much can you give? When's the last time you heard that sound? About something like uh, 1968 was the last time I heard a sound like that. Really? So definitely. That's the one thing I, I really enjoyed is when we opened up with those 60s. When I fired that M60 this morning, it was, of course, a privilege that I got to shoot it again or fire it again. And it brought back a lot of memories and, and a lot of memories of when I was in Vietnam. And it also, the firepower that that weapon has, it just, is it was exhilarating and it, I felt short breath because of the excitement and just the, the grabbing and grabbing the uh, the weapon again was very very uh, exciting the adrenaline was going it just reminded me of so much of all the things that uh, a lot of us veterans went through and did back in Vietnam we said it's either going to be college or it's going to be a uh, get drafted. A lot of my friends found other uh, branches to join. Uh, I played it, just said, no, no, I'm, I'm just gonna wait one way. I'm gonna, I wanna see if I can get into college. Uh, but our mindset was already that it was either, either or, and uh, for most of us, it was or. We always wound up uh, getting drafted at that time. As a matter of fact, uh, most of our, my, uh, the Vietnam veterans in San Antonio came from uh, Edgewood High School, and uh, most of them were on the the list of uh, not returning. So I went to high school and I went to uh, college and uh, graduated at the age of 21. I went knocking on the door of the University of Texas, but Uncle Sam uh, came back and said, nah, we don't want you to go to college. We want you to come with us, and that's how I wound up going to the United States Army was that I was drafted when I was 21. I got the privilege of riding on an APC uh, with the 25th Infantry Division, the three-quarter cab, and I was in Charlie Troop. Uh, and I got to ride on top of one of these vehicles. You couldn't ride inside because we were always afraid that an RPG rocket would penetrate the uh, skin of the APC and just wrote bender shot inside. So anybody inside would have got cut up or shot up. But uh, it was one of those things where when we sat on top, we knew when we had to fall in. The M60s that we had mounted on our APCs, we had one on the left and one on the right. And uh, the main turret was a 50 caliber machine gun. And then on behind me was a 30 caliber Browning. I got to man the M60 on the right, to which we addressed with uh, firing into, uh, to get uh, enemy fire to fire back at us. The drawing that we did one time on the other side of the Black Virgin Mountain, it was uh, A Troop was leading with uh, the three quarter cav or the 25th Air Division. I was in Charlie Troop, uh, a uh, Alpha Troop went in first, we were giving support fire, Bravo Troop went in second, and they uh, also withdrew. We were up next to go in, they said no, stop, hold. We had to stop and uh, withdraw to a point to where we set up our perimeter, 
and got ready for the, for the nighttime. When they tripped the flare, I mean, one of our flares, we just fired power. Everything went towards that flare. At night, we would just, you know, re, uh, shoot fire out, keep it at a safe perimeter. But it wasn't always safe, because we did get hit. I'm not gonna say it was a privilege, but I'm proud that I did get wounded, uh, not to the point where I almost lost my life, but it was close. And, and the idea again is that when you're laying there by yourself in the dark and you're wondering, am I gonna make it? Just like in the movies, they say you start thinking of things that you won't ever think that you will ever see again. Girlfriends, you know, memories of high school, memories of, uh, you know, prom friends, back at home, your mom, your dad, you know, you, you think about them, you get scared, of course, because you are scared. That's the only way you can in, endure or go through a firefight is that you're, there's something in you that just comes up and says, I'm going to fight this out. I'm going to go into battle. I am going to go and do what I have to do. Fear is one thing that we'll always have, but fear is not one thing that you want to bring forth while you're engaging in a battle or, or firefight. My father, which is a World War II veteran also, and you brought up thinking that this is the way you gotta be. You gotta be a protective, you gotta be, if you're in the military, you're a John Wayne. You got to be, have that attitude. And I went in with that attitude. I was scared, of course, because I was only 21 years old. I didn't have nobody going alongside of me. And I always try to find humor out of everything that I, I, I live. My dad was served in World War II and he got shot in the right buttocks. Well, guess where I got shot? I got shot in the same place he got, the right buttocks. You know, but not only that, but you see, you got five fingers over here. Well, see, I got four and a half. See, I'm the only guy that can do fractions. It's like you can do two and a half there, you know, so, or one and a half there, two and a half, and, uh, I won't do the other one. <laughs> I'll go to kids and I go, listen, you see this? Yes, blow on it. They blow on it, ta-da. They go, oh, how'd you do that? Blow on it again, ta-da. That was what I got. The funniest part I got out of uh, going to Vietnam and coming home. We went, we served, we did our time and we came home. Not to a happy home, but we came home. The uh, Vietnam veteran, when you returned, you know, there was a lot of animosity. There was a lot of things saying, you know, why are we over there? Uh, for us, we were there to do a job. When we returned, the, I hardly ever saw any animosity in, in San Antonio or Texas, but I did know of it and I, did encounter some of it. You know, we were, you know, uh, they came home instead of saying, hey, welcome home. Uh, even to my own family, nobody, hey, hey, glad to see you, that's it, one, two, three. It wasn't as hard, like it was back in World War II when, you know, you got home, you see these ships coming in with soldiers in them, people, girls running up and hugging them uh, like they did on 42nd Street. You know, we didn't see that. All we saw was signs saying, Navy killers, you know, uh, murderers, uh, you know, things like that. That was just, we were going like, are you serious? He says, do you know what I just been through? They, again, they didn't know what we were going through. Dying, you know, getting shot, losing legs, losing limbs, losing uh, uh, a lot of stuff that are our visions. And, and, you know, we expect to say, you know what? God, how can, how can that be, be that way? The media was giving us the news of what was going on, but they weren't going towards what the soldier was going through. They were going to what the war was going through. And, and that again, there should have been more attention brought to the soldier, which is the one thing that, uh, again, now we're trying to focus on more and trying to help the veterans to get by that. I learned that in, in, in the military, how close military guys can get and are close when we're in the military. After the military, well, of course, we all start changing. And, uh, but a lot of us still uphold the camaraderie 
that a military guy has. You know, it's that kind of camaraderie that I wish, you know, sometimes I would still wish that I was surrounded by these guys. I see that no matter what color you are, no matter how tall you are, how short you are, how fat you are, how skinny you are, or, you know, who your mother was, who your father was, it has nothing to do with it when you're sitting or running or standing alongside one of your comrades. That you expect that soldier to take care of your back. I had one friend of mine that he was uh, one of the most decorated uh, soldiers in uh, Vietnam, and that was Fernando Herrera. He was uh, in Alpha Troop. We, did, I didn't, we didn't even know this till we got back to the States. And that was, uh, he was serving with the uh, Alpha Troop, and I was serving with Charlie Troop. We went like this in a, in a firefight, and I didn't even know he was there till we sat down one time and drinking some uh, beers and you know uh, listen to music and we start talking about it and then he noticed my pen and he says you were with the 25th and I said yeah I was told him who I was and I said no way he says yeah I was with him and he says no wait a minute I was with Alpha Troop same division same troop but I was with Alpha Troop you were and wow we didn't know how close we were to each other and how he got wounded how I got wounded and yet we never actually got to see each other, you know, but yet we were still thinking about it, talking about it, and the camaraderie that we had then still came over to where it is now. And uh, you talk to any military guy, it's, it's always the same thing. You know, we're, we're there for you, we're here for you, and that's the kind of camaraderie you want in a battle. Well, there's a lot of battles going on right now here. Uh, we got a lot of suicide, we got a lot of homeless. The general public wants us to house them and they're going, why? I don't want to live in a house. They, wanna, they don't want to do that. They teach us how to fight. They teach us how to control everything we control when we're in battle, but they never teach us how to come out of that. They never, they never take us to one side and say, hey, let me show you now that you're not in battle. You don't have to do this anymore. You don't have to sleep with your hand on your rifle. You don't have to sleep there thinking about this. Your mind has to withdraw. We had a breakfast for our veterans and I'm going, wait a minute, why are we getting together? And then it dawned on me. Each veteran has, to, has the privilege or can come and talk to another veteran to tell that veteran his story. And the other veteran tells him his story because then they'll listen to each other. Most of the time, they say, well, I gotta go to my pastor, I gotta go to my uh, uh, priest, I gotta go to my wife, my dad, my mom, uh, my uncles, and my cousins, and tell them what's going on, what I did. And the kid, everybody else goes, yes, uh-huh, you, oh, great, yes, uh-huh, I believe it, yeah. I know, I know what you're going through, man. You don't know what they went through. You don't know. You weren't there, you never experienced what it is for a man to see another man die. You never experience him to see him get wounded. You never see his blood splatter on him, on you or, or anything else. And when they get to talk to another veteran that went through the same ordeal, he gets to release that. He gets to tell people, you know, his fellow veterans that this is what I went through, man. And it's a release because otherwise that they don't have a release. And this is the one time that we need to get together and just listen to them, but listen to them. Don't tell them you care. I mean, that you know what they're going through because you don't know. You weren't there, but you can listen to them. You can hear the hurt. You can hear the pain that they go through in their mental anguish. That's why they want to commit suicide because they can't release it. So they got to be releasing. And as far as our, our medical units, they need to get in there and like they train us to do one thing, well now you gotta train us not to do those things anymore. And that's where it's at.
I think out of my perspective, as far as for the veterans and everybody that, or anybody that has been in a conflict or has not been in a conflict, because I'm a firm believer that if you wore the uniform, you're military, man. You part of it. You serve. You gave your time. I got a lot of guys that are doctors and and people that are desk jockeys and that worked in the Pentagon and going, no man, I didn't. I can't be there. Why can't you be there? You're part of the combat unit, man. You supported us. You helped us do what we had to do. So you are military, and you should be there to. Uh, be recognized as that as a veteran. We had a lot of people that ran from our country and didn't do what they had to do. They weren't there. And and the thing about it, they were we were there. That that's a history. And each man's story, each veteran that is out there that ha each one has a different story. And it should be documented. All these soldiers, and I say that as soldiers, not as races or you know, individuals, female, male, they're all part of it. They all have stories and they should be told and it should be kept in history because it's all great when you can tell what the story is, like when it started way back then when uh, Truman was in office and uh, how Ho Chi Minh came and got involved and how he tried to give it to, uh, to America and America says, no, we can't do that because we gotta help the French, and the French were the ones that were fighting against Vietnam. But that's the story of what happened. As for the individual veteran, there's nothing out there. You can't tell that Bill, Joe, John, what did they do? How did he give his life up? How is he a missing in action member? How did his body wind up in, in uh, uh, China, where I'm buried somewhere where nobody knows where he's at, you know? Uh, those are all things that have to be told in, in each person. And uh, I've tried, you know, I'm trying to figure out how I can do that. And that's what I like about this, what you're doing now, is that it's another piece to the clog of saying, we're going to set it all up for all these veterans, you know, like they did at the, the wall in Washington, D.C. And the guy came over and said, look, dude, so I just want to thank you for your service in Vietnam. And I go, oh, yeah, thank you. And he says, I was in Iraq. You guys had it harder than we did. And I'm going, how do you figure, you know? But that's what he said. And I, I, to this day, I'm still trying to figure it out. War is war. You're getting shot, you're getting shot. Uh, the only difference would be the terrain. You know, that we had to go through rice paddies and and uh, every time you walk into a, a puddle or cross a river, you look in your pants, you see leeches on your pants. And uh, they never had that, but they had landmines. They got a whole different situation. So you, you find sympathy in what they're going through because of the way they're going through it, but you also got to know how they're going through it and what they're going through. I think each generation has to uh, take on what battle it has to take on, all the way, including all the way to the Civil War. The war between the states, they had their battle to fight against Americans. Then you went on to World War I, where we had to fight the Germans. In Vietnam, again, you think about it and you go, God, you, those people in, that fought in Korea, yeah. they had it bad. They had snow, they had trenches, lives were taken. I lost uh, some good friends of mine, and I know what that is. World War II, uh, my dad, same thing. He lost a lot of his friends that were with him in combat, and, they, and then Korean War II also lost a lot of people. You have to follow the history of all that right there, how far back it goes, and what causes us for us to, as Americans, to go to combat. And we start thinking about that. You know, just like the Vietnam War, I found out why or how it started. And I'm wondering, why was I there fighting a war for somebody else? We were doing it for the, uh, the uh, what you would say, or what we would like to say is for America. We did it for the American uh, people, the American public. 
We stood by our officers. We believed in our pledge. We united, we pledged and gave our oath to the United States of America. We believed in it and we still, to this day, as a veteran, still, we believe that our oath is sacred and we uphold it and we believe in it and we trust it. Uh, every year that I said, I've told you before is that we've had uh, get-togethers to where we all vent and say what has happened to us. And I have yet to find one veteran that is, has a negative view of the United States of America and what it stands for.